Hey everybody, Henry here. So we're going to go over the pediatric section of uh, the GI ultrasound. We're going to start from uh, head to toe with the stomach. So uh, with the stomach, uh, things you can see on ultrasound are gastric tumors, which are very rare. Uh, teratomas comprise 1% or less than 1% of gastric tumors. And carcinomas are 0.05%, so these are very rare. You can also have bezoars, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, and duodenitis. There's just a couple of things you can see. All right, so here we have a um, immature gastric teratoma from a case report from the Korean Journal of Radiology. This is a three-month-old male. Uh, on the left upper part of the screen, you can see a heterogeneous mass with solid and cystic components. And then uh, two CT uh, exams showing a very large mass in the left upper, upper quadrant of the abdomen with uh, dense material which could be bone or teeth and then here we have a, a cross section of a cut specimen so this was a, a gastric uh, teratoma which is uh, like I said earlier very uncommon and it's more common in males all right a bezoar so a bezoar is just a mass of partially digested or undigested material which could be food it could be hair it's anything that your body cannot digest if you put too much of it into your stomach or your intestines the, it will clump up and create a mass uh, there are three types, phytobezoars, which is uh, made of plant material, trichobezoars, which is made out of hair, and pharmacobezoars, which is made out of pharmaceutical material. Um, trichobezoars are probably the most common we'd see in America. Uh, some people have uh, conditions uh, like trichotillomania, which is an obsessive compulsive condition where you pull your hair. Uh, some people who also pull their hair eat it. If you didn't eat enough hair, um, it can develop into a ball in your stomach and create a bezoar. This is an image of a phytobezoar. These are more co common in countries where they eat um, lots of vegetables that are, that are hard to digest. So here is a case of a, of a trichobezoar. So here is a stomach-shaped mass of hair. And here is the ultrasound image. You can see the echogenic surface of the hair and then shadowing. And then here is the stomach. And here is a piece of the liver. All right, so pyloric stenosis. Pyloric stenosis is a pretty common condition. Uh, it's most common between two weeks and two months of life, more common in boys than girls. Um, the clinical signs would be uh, projectile vomiting, non-bilis vomiting. Um, uh, another clinical sign would be the palpable olive sign. This is a, when you're palpating the abdomen, you might feel a little mass, and it's called the palpable olive. Um, other clinical findings could be hypokalemia, or low potassium in the blood and metabolic alkalosis. On imaging, we usually scan in the epi epigastric to right upper quadrant regions. Um, uh, if, you, if the, the gay baby has a lot of gas or air, you can turn them right lateral the cubitus and hopefully the air will, will move away from the pylorus and towards the fundus of the stomach. Um, the thickness should be three millimeters or less, typically less than three, three millimeters, um, and under 14 millimeters. Um, also, in real time, you can see food and liquid going through the pylorus. Alright, so here we have a sagittal and transverse view of the, of the pylorus. This is the stomach. You can see a stomach lining here with the, with the gut signature. You can see all the layers. This is the longitudinal, very thick muscle. You would measure from here to here and from here to here, and then this is transverse, it's target light lesion, and then anterior to it is the stomach. Here you got a little bit of liver. Here's another case. Transverse here, you're, you're longitudinal on the pylorus, but you're transverse on the epigastric region of the, of the belly. So here you got the pylorus and lung. You got your gallbladder right here, piece of the liver. You got air in the stomach, fluid. This is the muscle, the muscle is 0.5 or five millimeters, and the length was 24 millimeters, or 2.4 centimeters. So um, these have also been called, uh, they appear like a little cervix, for those of you that do um, endovaginal ultrasounds for cervical lengths, it has a similar appearance to a positive pyloric stenosis. All right, so now let's move on to the small intestine. A few things you can see would be a small bowel interception which is an intermittent condition. It goes away on its own, doesn't require any treatment. Inflammatory bowel disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, 
Hinox Shunlane Purpura, Meckles Diverticulum, and Duplication Cyst, to name a few. With duodenitis, it's not very commonly seen on ultrasound, but you can see it. It's an inflammation of the duodenum. Uh, common symptoms are epigastric pain, nausea, bloating, and causes are drugs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and alcohol can cause inflammation of the duodenum. Also infection, stress, and in some cases radiation, if it's focused to that, to that region. So here, this was a case, a uh, young adolescent male, teenager. Um, this is, I'm sagittal on the abdomen here. You got this mass, this thick walled mass here. And it turned out to be the duodenum. You can follow it back to the stomach. Here you can see the common bowel duct was also prominent. Not enlarged, but prominent. And here's a coronal-like view through the pancreas, showing the, the second part of the duodenum. The first part was here, it wasn't that as thickened. And then here's your right kidney. And then your gastroduodenal artery at the head of the pancreas and your um, portal vein. All right, so small bowel intussusception, like I said before, is typically transient. Is an incidental finding uh, for other reasons. You might see they might order an ultrasound for an appendix or for, uh, or, or for an intussusception and you might notice that you have a smaller intussusception like lesion, but usually not in the right upper or right lower quadrant where the iliocolics usually are. Um, it is incidental, uh, they're smaller than the large bowel intussusceptions, so usually the mean diameter is about 1.4 centimeters, and you can have clinical symptoms with this, but they're usually not comparable to iliocolic intussusceptions. So this is a, uh, a young girl, I think she was an 8-year-old girl, uh, right here in the right upper quadrant, because you got the, the gallbladder right here, you have this intussusception, it's a target-like lesion, it looks like a donut or a bullseye, but it's measuring 1.7 centimeters, it's kind of small. And here it is in longitudinal. And then 15 minutes later, it wasn't there anymore. So if you do see a uh, small bowel intussusception, or if you see uh, something you think is a small bowel intussusception, especially if it's like in the left upper or left lower quadrants, or midline, epi or epigastric, or pelvic regions, um, just wait, measure it, put Doppler on it, um, wait, and see if it goes away by itself. They typically do. Here's another case, three-year-old female. Left upper quadrant, so iliocolic, if you remember, the, the ilium and the colon is on the right lower part of the abdomen. This is in the left upper quadrant nearby the spleen. You have a small target-like lesion. It measure, I don't have the measurements here, but you can tell it's small. And here it is in sagittal. You can see it going into itself right here. And then 15 minutes later, it was gone. And this patient was asymptomatic. And then this is another patient which uh, had a regular... Um, intussusception. They're two years old. They presented with uh, abdominal pain intermittently and jelly-like stools. So it's diarrhea with a little bit of blood. Um, here's right upper quadrant. You have a large target-like lesion. And then you can compare it side by side. He also had, incidentally, a small bowel intussusception in the left lower quadrant. And you can see it's about one, you know, two-thirds the size of the, of the iliocolic intussusception. So this was a cool case. All right, now Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease can affect any part of the GA system. Um, usually affects the terminal ileum to begin. Um, it's an autoimmune or autoimmune-mediated disease. Uh, it's less than 200,000 cases per year. Um, it's not very, very common, but there's a lot of awareness for this disease. The common symptoms include abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, anemia, and fatigue. And one thing that's, uh, especially when imaging or if you're doing a laparoscopy in one of these patients, you'll notice that they have something called creeping fat, which is usually you have the intestines and then the mesentery, mesenteric um, tissue, which kind of holds the, the, the intestines together, is made of mostly of fat. It becomes uh, very prominent. It starts to wrap around the intestines, close to the lateral parts of the intestines. All right, so this is a adolescent male. You see this is a... Um, a longitudinal image of the colon or the iliocolic region. You can see the bowel is very distended. There's a lot of material in it. And there's some thickening here and here. And if you notice, there's increased fat. Especially right here, you can definitely notice it. And right here, this increased fat. And it's also increased in echogenicity. It's, it was everywhere. Even in the, the parts in the right upper quadrant. Here you can see a little bit of bowel, right kidney, liver, and then all this fat, which is echogenic. 
which usually echogenic fat means called also called fat stranding, means that there's an inflammatory change that's causing the fat to either become edem edematous or filled with like lymphatic fluid that causes the increased echogenicity. All right, this is another patient, 11 year old male, severe pain, abdominal pain, and vomiting. You can see there's fat almost circum circumferentially around this loop of bowel right here, which is also hyperemic. So you got thickened bowel or a thickened bowel wall. You can see the internal contents there. Hyperemia, which is also a sign of inflammation, and then increased echogenicity of the fat, fat stranding, or also creeping fat with a little lymph node right here, and free fluid. So this patient was a known patient that had Crohn's disease. And this was small bowel that was inflamed, most likely ileum or jejunum. So this is a seven-year-old male. Uh, this patient had inflammatory inflammation of the terminal ileum. You can see there's a normal appendix, so the cecum would be around this region right here, and the appendix was normal, but there was thickening of the bowel wall of the ileum with hyperemia. All right, necrotizing enterocolitis is something that we see in premature babies uh, a lot. Um, most cases happen in premature infants, so 90, over 90% of, of uh, cases of necrotizing enterocolitis happen in premature infants. Uh, it, the, the frequency is 1 to 3 per 1,000 live births. What happens is ischemic necrosis. So ischemia leads to necrosis of the bowel. The bowel is re has reduced blood flow, which then leads to uh, the tissue death of the bowel. Once the tissue starts to die, um, gases start to be re uh, released and gets trapped within the wall of the intestines, and that's called pneumatosis intestinalis. This via the vasculature, these, this gas can lead up into the mesenteric vessels and then go up into the portal vein. And you can see in real time portal venous gas within the portal, uh, portal venous system of the liver. Um, it, connect, it can affect any part of the intestines and has a mortality rate of 10 to 50%. So here's a, a newborn premature infant who had um, all these little echogenic spaces right here within the, the gastric wall with some dirty reverb shadowing was consistent for air, you can see there, all these little echogenic dots. Um, this is also diagnosed with, um, with x-rays. So here you can see some more echogenicities there. And within the liver tissue, you can see air within the portal venous system. So that's consistent with the pneumatosis intestinalis. Here this is bowel, um, bowel wall thickening as well. So this was a, a case that was thought to be from necrotizing enterocolitis. So this baby had some diarrhea, seven month old diarrhea weight loss. When they scanned the baby, the female, she had multiple speckles, echogenic speckles within the liver all over, which was thought to be portal venous gas, which probably was. But <clears throat> oddly enough, the next day we scanned her and her liver looked normal, as you see. So this patient ended up having Clostridium difficile or C. diff. So probably the C. diff did cause some bowel to maybe uh, die and slough off and create gas, which then went up into the portal venous system. But she, she recovered within a day, and that was pretty interesting. All right, so Henoch-Shanley purpura is a rare disease, less than 200,000 cases annually. Um, it is a systemic vasculitis of small vessels in the body. It can affect any organ system. Um, many people who have Henoch-Shanley will have a rash and usually it will be in the lower extremities uh, or the buttock region as well. Um, they can develop bowel wall thickening and hemorrhage from the vasculitis, which the vasculitis itself can cause a hemorrhage into the wall of the intestines, which can act as a lead point for an intussusception. This is a young male who had uh, abdominal pain, and he was a known patient that had henoxanilin purpura. You can see there's small bowel wall thickening of the jejunum, and not much hyperemia. This is another case, 12 year old male, came in with abdominal pain, known, known Henoch shine line. He's got small bowel wall thickening. You see the gut signature here. There's fluid within the bowel, uh, hyperemia. And here, when you look at the antrum of the stomach, this is like if you were doing a pylorus, but since this kid's 12, it's not gonna have the similar appearance as a baby, but this is pretty much the pyloric antrum here. And you see the, the bowel wall was very thickened from here to here. Here's the muscular layer here, the submucosa. All right, so here's a 
short axis view of the bowel. See it's thickened. All right, Meckel's diverticulum. It is the most common congenital abnormality of small bowel. It happens uh, from incomplete obliteration of the vitelline duct, um, which is also called the um, omphalomesenteric duct, which is a, a small, thin tube that connects the yolk sac to the midgut of an embryo. Um, it is usually asymptomatic. Some people have it, they don't know. Unless it can cause problems, then they, they can later find out. Because it can lead to bleeding. It can also lead to intersusception by acting as a lead point. This is a patient who had a intersusception who kept on coming over in a period of two days because the patient would have a, a reduction with an air enema and then the intersusception would uh, reoccur. So this patient was scanned at least like six or seven times. You know, they, fi they figured that it was not going to stop so there, pro there probably was a pathological lead point that needed to be discovered in order to, to do, um, which kept on causing the intersusception. So she had surgery which led to the diagnosis of a Meckel's diverticulum. Now in these images, we don't really see it in Meckel's. We see large intestine, and we see small intestine, and we also see some mesenteric fat. But we know that because of surgery, the patient had, had a uh, Meckel's diverticulum. So that's something to keep in mind if you have a patient that's been coming back to your department over and over again, and the, the intersusception is not reduced, or it keeps on recurring. All right, intussusception uh, is a pretty common condition we see in the pediatric ER. Um, usually they come in with intermittent pain. They start, once the intussusception starts to uh, maybe peristalse, they'll have very severe pain. They'll, they'll be crying. Then a few moments later, they'll be fine, like if, they're, like if they have no problems. Um, they can also have what's called jelly current stool, which is, uh, if you have an intussusception for a pretty long time, um, it can cause edema, you know, uh, vascular edema, which can lead to death of tissue, which the internal mucosa of the intestine can slough off and go out of the body via diarrhea. So the diarrhea will be red, and they call it, it looks like jelly. The most common form of large bowel intussusception would be the ileocolic. That would be where the ileum, which is usually right here, this is the ileum, goes and folds into the the first part of this, uh, the cecum and the ascending colon. Other things you can see with the large intestines are inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. You could also see uh, diverticulitis or diverticulosis. Usually diverticulitis. Diverticulosis is not routinely diagnosed with ultrasound. So like I said before, interception is an obstruction of the, which what happens to the bowel is it telescopes into, into itself. So let's pretend this is the the, the ascending colon or the cecum, and then this is the ileum. This part folds into this part, creating an obstruction. Uh, on transverse, you'll have a donut lesion. This looks very tasty right now. Or a target-like lesion. Um, is, it is an obstruction. Um, the mean diameter is usually 2.6 centimeters, much bigger than the 1.4 uh, I mentioned earlier for the small bowel interceptions. Um, a lot of cases are idiopathic. Um, they don't know what's causing it. Usually they think it's lymphadenopathy where the enlarged lymph nodes are acting as a lead point. Uh, other cases you have hemorrhages that act as a lead point or Meckel's diverticulum. And the symptoms, as I said before, vomiting, intermittent crying, crampy abdominal pain, and current jelly stool. And here's a, a good mnemonic. Like the movie Inception, a dream within a dream. Well, intersession is like a bowel within a bowel. And it's kind of funny. So here you got a little diagram. The proximal part is called the intussusceptum. And then the distal part is called the intussuscepiens, or the receiving part. So just think recipient, or receiving, is the part that's distal. In the case of ileocolic, this would be the ileum, this would be the cecum. All right, here's a very nice case of a large ileocolic intussusception that went all the way from the right lower quadrant all the way up to the right upper quadrant. Here you can see a thick-walled colon with a mesenteric fat, and here's the ileum within it. And here's a longitudinal image. Here you can see the interior wall of the colon, and then the ileum right here with some mesenteric fat and a lymph node. So this is what they call the pseudo-kidney sign, because it has a similar appearance to a kidney with the sinus fat and then the cortex. Some cases look much more than a pseudo kidney than this. And I'm using finger air quotes that you can't see. So 
So here's another intussusception. One-year-old male. You see it's in, the, it's in the right upper quadrant. Here's your right kidney. Here's a piece of liver. And here's your target lesion and transverse. And here it is in longitudinal. So you have the large bowel outside. And then here you have the ileum within it. And you also have many lymph nodes. Which a lot of times you will see lymph nodes. Sometimes you might not see it within the intussusception, but you will see a lot of uh, mesenteric lymph nodes. Here's another case which a patient had intussusception. And if you look at the wall, it looks kind of heterogeneous. It looks like there's little cystic spaces. There's free fluid as well. And it just had an abnormal appearance. This patient actually had the intussusception so long that it led to uh, ischemia and necrosis of the bowel. She had to have surgery to have you know, a section of bowel removed, seven-month-old female. Oh, and, and on surgery, it was found that she had a duplication cyst that was causing the intussusception. And we'll go over duplication cysts in a second. So colitis is an inflammation of the colon. Obviously, col means colon, itis means inflammation. Um, here you have three views. This is a normal colon. This is a mildly inflamed colon. This is a severely inflamed colon. Uh, types, autoimmune, cold, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. Uh, you could also have an infectious colitis caused by many, many bacteria, E. coli, C. diff, Salmonella, and Campylobacter, to name a few. This is a 13-year-old female. She had inflama inflammation of the bowel. Here you have a panoramic view, tip of the liver, inferior pole of the right kidney, and then all this is ascending colon. You can see the submucosa, the echogenic part, is very thickened. Here you see it again. And this patient ended up having colitis, which was caused by Campylo Campylobacter bacteria. Here's another case, same thing. Here's a longitudinal panoramic view of the ascending colon. The cecum would be here. You see how the cecum is much broader than the rest of the ascending colon. Here's in transverse. This is your psoas muscle behind. You have some submucosal thickening, thickening of the entire bowel wall from here to here. And you can see all the layers. All right, mesenteric adenitis. If you have a patient that has abdominal pain, they order an intussusception, they order an appendix, they order a gallbladder, everything comes out normal. But when you do uh, the right lower and left lower quadrants, or usually the right lower, you'll notice that they have lymph nodes. And they're large, they might be hyperemic. They have several. It is very common. Uh, up to 20% of appendic appendectomy patients also have uh, swollen mesenteric lymph nodes. If you have a cluster in the right lower quadrant, at least three, all measuring greater than five millimeters, that's pretty diagnostic. End up absence of any other pathological condition um, and if you as you're scanning if you press on these nodes they might have the patient might have some um, some tenderness and it can mimic appendicitis so here's a case several lymph nodes here you got your iliac artery common iliac artery common iliac vein piece of vertebrae so it's like a transverse off to the side you got lymph nodes here Smaller ones here, bowel. Here's a sagittal, you got your psoas muscle, intestine here, and longitudinal lymph nodes, all enlarged. Again, psoas muscle, lymph node, bowel, lymph node, lymph node, lymph node, bowel. Here's another one, lymph node, lymph node, lymph node. Very common. All right, I'm not gonna go over um, appendix because I have a se separate appendix that lecture that I'm linking to in the blog. Next. So Burkitt's lymphoma is a, it's a highly aggressive B-cell, non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It's considered the fastest growing human tumor. Uh, there are three types, um, endemic variant, which we don't usually see here in the, you know, in the Western world, which is caused by uh, malaria and Epstein-Barr virus infections. And these commonly, these commonly affect the jaw, as, of, as well as the distal ileum and cecum, ovaries, kidneys, and breast. Uh, there's another type called the sporadic type, which is the common type we will see, or, or at least people scanning in, in the Western uh, countries. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's, it's uh, 30 to 50% happened in childhood, and the uh, ileocecal region is the most common area affected. And then there's also immunodeficiency associated, so people who have HIV or other immunocompromising diseases can develop Burkitt's lymphoma. So here we have a 14-year-old male. He came to the ER with you know, abdominal, uh, right lower quadrant pain. It was thought that he had maybe an appendicitis. We scanned him and we saw the appendix was very large. Here you have your blind ending, a very large appendix. But however, there was this mass-like structure posterior to it. So they're worried about maybe a rupture, but if you 
once we put Doppler in it, you see there's actual flow within it, so that's not fluid, that's an actual mass. And it was about almost 8 centimeters, so that's pretty big. Um, pathology confirmed that this was a Burkitt's lymphoma. And he did well after we scanned him again to make sure that he didn't develop any abscesses or anything like that, and he was doing better. Okay, so this is another case which happened after the, the previous one I just showed you. And we had a patient sent for an appendix ultrasound. We found the appendix tip right here. So you see you got a long appendix here, tip is right here, normal. But as we got close to cecum, it, it looked like it got larger with some, some mild hyperemia. And then here in the cecum, it looked like there may be a mass. And here is another view. So they thought that this case might also be a Burkitt's lymphoma, but when this patient went to surgery, they removed the appendix and they had to remove a piece of the cecum. However, it was a it was an appendiceal intussusception. So the, intussuscept the appendix intussuscepted into the cecum and got stuck, causing the, the congestion and abdominal pain. So that was a pretty uh, cool case. All right, I said earlier I was going to mention duplication cysts. They're a congenital malformation. They're rare. Um, they uh, are usually a cyst. They have an epithelial lining and have within the wall portions of the GI tract. So when you see the cyst, it's going to look, have, instead of a thin epithelial lining, it's going to have a thicker lining and it's going to have a gut signature. Uh, they commonly, commonly occur near the ileum, also in esophagus and colon. Um, they may cause vomiting, nausea, bleeding, perforation or obstruction, or they may be asymptomatic. Here was an uh, adolescent female sent for pelvic ultrasound for ab abdominal pain. They saw the cystic structure within the pelvis. Right ovary, left ovary, uterus are normal. So as you can see here, it has layers within the wall. So that's a gut signature. So this turned out to be a duplication cyst, 4.9 centimeters, pretty large. Here's another case. This is a, a young male. And this, at first, you might think is the bladder. But this was in the left upper quadrant near the, here you see the left kidney right here. And this is it in transverse. And you can definitely see the multiple layers or the gut signature. Hypoechoic, hyperechoic, hypoechoic, hyperechoic. So those that, that that gut signature, the five layers that I talk about in the blog post for those that are starting off with gastric ultrasound. So this was about almost seven centimeters. So it's pretty All right, megavolvulus. Megavolvulus is a congenital malrotation of the gut. 75% uh, of cases present within a month of birth, and the 90% the 90, 90 present within the first year of life. Um, so what happens is the vessels that, are, that lead or come from the intestines um, wrap around the intestines, or the intestines wrap around the vessels, like, uh, like pretty much like a helix or maybe barber pole type configuration. Um, the... SMA and the SMV get, uh, are inversed or are inverted. On Doppler, you'll see a whirlpool or corkscrew sign. Um, this twisting of the bowel can lead to ischemia and necrosis, so tissue death, and it is a, it is a surgical emergency. Here's a one-year-old male, had a bilis vomiting, so they're vomiting with bile in it. And on the color Doppler images, on an image without color, uh, somebody who's new to GI ultrasounds might think this is an intussusception. But if in real time, you'll see the SMA will be in the center and it'll be pulsing. So if you stay there, you'll notice that there's something a little different going on than an intussusception. If you put on color Doppler, you'll have this whirlpool sign. And here's another one. So you see all the concentric rings of blood vessels wrapping around. And this is pretty much what happens. You have the intestines with the blood vessels. And then they twist around, and then this part of the bowel, from uh, you know congestion of the blood not being able to, able to escape, escape, and no arterial blood going into it, uh, can die. And here's a quick video of a cine loop going up and down, amygdala volvulus. See some, and then with color is obvious. All right, so this was a different case. This was a, an eight-year-old male who had a appendix-like symptoms. So they sent him for an appendix ultrasound. When we scanned him, we're seeing this tip of the liver here, right upper quadrant. There's fat stranding up here, a lot of fat stranding. 
um, and as you go lower some more fat stranding here is bowel this might be appendix uh, we weren't too sure and then there's this hypoechoic region which we thought perhaps was fluid echogenic fluid and there's a little bit of hyperemia within this um, but this was a case of mesenteric infarction so here you got the part of the mesenteric tissue or the fat that infarcted and died uh, it's it's a it's a thing we see every now and again and it's good to see what it might look like with an ultrasound um, this patient obviously needed CT to confirm whether they had an appendicitis that had ruptured or not as we weren't too confident to call it so I thought this was a pretty cool uh, case to share so this is a one-year-old female they ordered uh, for an ab abdomen for interception so we pretty much scanned all four quadrants mid light epigastric region umbilical region and pelvic region as well the bladder was pretty full you can see right here with bladder full of urine and then here's a piece of the uterus and then posterior to the uterus within the intestine because this is the rectum here and then you can see the the dilated rectum here there was this lesion here which when i'm scanning i'm like is this what is this, is this? i thought it was maybe a toy or something because it looked pretty big but when you measure it's only two centimeters and I was like, hmm, what could this be? And then, so I started asking the moms, could the baby have swallowed anything? You know, maybe a toy, a little boat toy or something like that. And mom said she didn't think that the baby had swallowed anything. I was like, I mean, has there, you know, do you think she could have put something in her, in her rectum? I asked her. And then mom says that she had put a suppository. So then it just clicked. And here's a picture of a suppository. For, so you see it has the same bullet type shape and scanning this I knew it wasn't something organic it wasn't like a mass or anything like that so I knew it was something foreign but it was interesting to see what a suppository looked like so I hope you enjoyed those cases um, and the blog post the beginning part of the blog post is pretty much all about how to uh, scan and what are the normal findings and then I just wanted to include some pathological cases to go along with it all right take care